and we had a coral head right by the side of the ship, but really by the side of the ship. We didn't hit it because this miracles that sometimes happen, you know. Placed a sort of an ornament in their upper lip that is growing with the time. It's something very interesting. We talked to these ladies. They were super nice to us. Obviously, they authorized us to go to the Kero Nuni Island. So it took exactly the same time or more? <laughs> and under the sun and not moving and people are really desperate. So, hello everyone and welcome to Underwater Adventures with Alex Mirabal. Today we will have another episode of the series Risking Your Life for Archaeology, so let's dive into it. As part of our investigation in Mozambique, we got in the year 2005, we got an information from our partner in Mozambique that a group of fishermen have found a quite interesting wreck in the Kirimbas archipelago in the north of the country, close to the border with Tanzania. It's a part far away to the north. The Kirimbas archipelago is a very interesting and big archipelago. It's a plenty of islands. And we didn't have the license to go to that place. The license that my group has was in the province of Nampula. The province of Nampula is the province where we were authorized to look for shipwrecks and to study shipwrecks. So this demanded that our partner apply to the Minister of Culture for a special license for us to go and check that information from fishermen. So the licenses are really given by zoning, like such a specific zoning. If you go, I'm saying a silly number, 10 kilometers to the left, then you cannot work there anymore. It might be that your license doesn't cover it. Yes, you apply for licenses and you are given licenses for a certain area and you explain why do you need that area, which are the shipwrecks you expect to find in that area and then it's delimited by GPS positions so you have an area in which you have authorization to work and other areas that you simply have to either apply for another license or wait for this license to expire and then apply for another area. Yes, that is pretty much like that in every country. So they generally, they try to give you a license for the coordinates specifically that you request and not really like a zoning of X radius. Yeah, it's for the yeah. area you request that you supposedly have reasons why you want to go <laughs> to that area. In this case, I was really looking forward to go to the Kirimbas Archipelago because I knew that it was a beautiful place. Everybody that has been there told me, and as it was not in our license area, I'd never been there. So I was very happy when our partner informed that yes, we got this special license to go and check on that shipwreck in the Kirimba archipelago. And there we went. This story has a lot of interesting issues. The first one was that we arrived there. The Kirimba archipelago belongs to the Cabo Legado province. It's the northern province of Mozambique. It has obviously its own government, which is different from the government of the province of Nampula. And the first thing we did obviously was to go there to the government and present sent our licenses and informed them, okay, we have authorization to go here and there, we come here to inform you, we want to check on this shipwreck. The guy said, okay, sure, there is no problem uh, whatsoever with us, but do you need to ask the elders of the community that <laughs> runs those islands so they accept your licenses, they give you permission. For me, it was a little bit of a surprise because I assume, okay, I have a license from the capital of the country, from Maputo, and I just inform the local authorities and I should have authorization to go. And they said, yeah, with them was no problem, but I have to talk to these, the elders of the community. I remember that was the expression, the elders of the community. So Sorry, that kind of highlights really the cultural differences also from very Western to other cultures. I find it so 
interesting that you would think, yeah, a government giving you the yes is all that you need. But I think that because the elders and because for them community is so important to survival and to be able to grow as a community, as a country, as an area, yeah, you got to ask the elders. I can tell you yes, but maybe the elders have an issue with it and we should take it into account. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, it is super nice, but also yeah. I have faced that also in Indonesia. These are countries which are quite big and the populations are quite separated one from the other. So local governments, let's call them this way, local governments have a lot of power because in the case of the Kirimbas Island, the Kirimbas archipelago and these elders of the community that I was about to meet, they don't know where Maputo is. They don't they don't even speak Portuguese. They have their own area, they control their own area, and yes, obviously they know they belong to a country called Mozambique, but they, they don't really follow exactly what Maputo says and let alone the Minister of Culture. And for them, what happens in Maputo and what might work in Maputo might not work for them. And imagine you guys come, you do what you need to do, disturb the area and then bounce and they never see you guys ever again. So, exactly. yeah, they want to protect themselves. Exactly. And also the central government of the country is aware of these kind of things because this group of people, they have specific needs and they don't need to be abused or mistreated or something done that will eventually harm their income or their way of living. So for their longer term. Yeah. So yeah. there we went to the island of Ibo. Ibo Island is, let's say, like the main island of the Kirimbas archipelago. It's a small island. Still, it's a little bit larger than the island of Mozambique that I have mentioned so many times. It's about four kilometers, like twice the size of the island of Mozambique. It has a beautiful fortress. Portuguese also built a fortress in that small island in the north, in the Kirimbas archipelago. It has a little settlement with some houses and some streets and there the leaders of the community, these elders of the community received us with in old fashion under a tree <laughs> and to my surprise the elders of a community were ladies, were a group of ladies, there were no guys, there were a group of ladies, some were elders, some were old, some, yeah, were, ladies. Yeah, <laughs> some were not that old. And no, and it makes all sense because the men of They're the matriarch cultures, no, no? Yes, and also the men of the community, they are far away fishing. So actually, yeah. we were asking permission to go and visit one of the islands where the men of that community were there working. So yeah, we sat under a tree, we put this nice capulana on the grass and we talked, they were super nice to us. I had to use, let's say, it, it's not even a translator because the Mozambicans that work in my team, they were from Nampula, so they speak, They also don't speak it. No, they spoke Makua, and what they speak in, the, in Cabo Delgado <laughs> is a different thing. But still, they, they, we managed to communicate, I explained them what we wanted to do. It was a visit, a shipwreck that that their community has informed that they found. So it was all very clear. We sat there. They had these very interesting tattoos in the face. Some of them were old. These tattoos were not that clear, but you could see it when you talk to them personally. And also they have this tradition of they make a hole here in the upper lip and they place a sort of an ornament in their upper lip that is growing with the time. It's something very interesting. We talked to these ladies. They were super nice to us. Obviously, they authorized us to go to the Kero Niuni Island, the Kero Niuni Island, which is quite far away from the island of Ivo to the north. And in the Kero Niuni Island, 
there was the other part of this community that was fishing there. It's also something that happens quite a lot and that we saw quite a lot in Mozambique is that these small islands in the middle of nowhere, they are unpopulated. They have no population, no fixed population. But the fishermen go there for limited amount of time, like 10, 12 days. They stay there. They build some shacks and some little houses in which they salt or smoke the fish. So they go fishing there for a while. They keep the fish. They they salt it or they smoke it in the island. Obviously, there is no electricity, so they don't have freezers or anything to make the fish cold. So they need to either salt it or smoke it. Arriving there in the island was crazy because we left Evo. We went, it's about five or six hours navigation to Keroniuni. And we obviously arrived in Keroniuni by night because this is what we do. And we arrived there by night. I can tell you, the electronic charts, which are normally quite accurate, you can really trust your electronic charts when you are navigating by night. Well, in the Kirimbas archipelago is something that is not that accurate, I would say. <laughs> not so tracked. You would think that you guys with so much experience, you would organize yourselves to travel less at night, no? <laughs> Yeah, we actually like to travel at night because <laughs> okay. we, then we have the, the day to work. But I, I personally underestimate the inaccuracy of the chart regarding that place because we selected a nice anchorage to arrive there in the evening, drop the anchor and there in the morning if we need it, just to rectify your mooring in a better way. So that we did. We arrived in the island by night. Obviously, there is no light anywhere. As I mentioned, they have no electricity or anything. The island, as every island in Mozambique, is surrounded by a big reef, a large reef. In this so after you guys hit the reef, you realize you arrived? <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't hit the reef. It was not that bad. But we arrived there by night. We anchor and we wait for the next morning. We woke up in the morning. The sea was flat, was marvelous, excellent conditions to work. And we realized when we went out in the deck that, yes, we were anchoring six or seven meters of depth, which is okay for, it was okay for our ship, no danger at all. And we had a coral head right by the side of the ship, but really by the <laughs> side of the ship. We didn't hit it because these miracles that sometimes happen, you know. So I wasn't that far off. Okay, good to know. <laughs> you were nearby, but we didn't hit the reef. Yeah, obviously we <laughs> lift anchor and move away from there. But swiftly move to somewhere else. Yeah, somewhere <laughs> somewhere safer. We went to the island first thing in the morning to meet the people who were working there for them because they were the ones who found the remains of the ship, the wreck, what we supposed it was a wreck. So we arrived there, we talked to the guys. I can tell you walking in this island when you have probably tons of fish being salted and with the flies and with the smell of the fish, there are a few huts which are for smoking the fish. The smell when you arrive in the island is incredible. It's really, it takes you a good half an hour to get used to it and to, to be able to talk to the guys and to concentrate in what you want. <laughs> Another crazy thing is that precisely because of that activity of keeping the fish and cleaning fish and taking the guts out of the fish, the, a lot of birds. There, there are a lot no, of birds, a lot of animals. but there are a lot of rats. These yeah. rats came in their boats from land, I assume, from the continent, and they... And really, multiplied. <laughs> they, they infested the island. And, <laughs> well, you get, this, this is just a side comment. So, well, we talked to the guys. The guys agreed to show us the place, which was in the southern end of a coral reef, a huge coral reef, which is called Vadiasi Reef. It's funny because the island is called Keroniuni, but the reef is called Vadiasi, and it's really far away. We went there with our boat, with them, and I was expecting, yeah, okay, it's a little bit more there. It's a little bit more there. A little bit more there, 
went like two hours going <laughs> in the Zodiac with the guys to a very, a place where you have absolutely no reference. And this is something that amazed me from the fishermen, that you have no reference and the guys are just looking around in the water and said, okay, it's here. It, it's somewhere here. Fishermen have to be like born GPSs. How do you find the smallest marker to know where you are in the middle of the ocean? That's insane to me. That's something, I mean, that's something that has always surprised me. And I always admire that a lot from them. I made an effort in my entire career to emulate that, to learn from them. To learn how to do that, Which yeah. are the signs they mm -hmm, look the for and how mm -hmm. do they can orientate themselves so well. And, well, mm -hmm. few things I learned, but you really, to get that skill developed, you need to really work in the sea every day, all your life, and it will come to you. That is not exactly yeah. my case, but the more I am in the sea, the more I try to remember all the tips and all the advice they have gave me. So we went there, we dove in the place, we start exploring. Actually, it was a wreck. It was surprising for us because sometimes fishermen confuse, mainly when it's a very old shipwreck, fishermen confuse the signs. I mean, they normally don't recognize the cannons, but they recognize the anchors. Ballast stones for them doesn't exist. But you know those signs. Yeah. They know the location signs and you know these signs. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I was nicely surprised that what they say that it looked to them like a very old shipwreck, it was actually a very old shipwreck. And yeah. we arrived there, there were 13 iron cannons, a couple of anchors, ballast stones. You have the regular finds, you know, like the lead sheeting of the hull. This, this shipwreck had a very curious formation or a very curious concretion of cannonballs that I haven't seen in other wrecks. Because apparently the wood of the ship, the hull, of the ship lasted quite long there in the reef and the cannonballs accumulate in one spot they fuse together in with the oxidization they fuse together and then the wood of the ship disappear rotten away along the years and the formation of this concretion of cannonballs it looked like a giant mushroom because it was like, yeah, like the umbrella of the mushroom and then a small stem that connected to the bottom. When, when the wood disappeared, it was hollow underneath. So, very interesting. We were exploring that wreck for three or four days. It's very close to the reef. It's very shallow. Conditions in those days were quite good although it's in the southern end of the reef, which is the worst side of the reef in Mozambique because the predominant winds and waves come from the south. So this is the, let's say, like the southern part of the reefs in Mozambique is like the first barrier that the waves and the wind will encounter. So it's normally very rough, it's very rough. And we were exploring there and coming back to the ship, we have the ship anchored now in a better place, anchored in the northern side of the island. It was about, well, there were a few miles, I cannot say how many miles, but to go back to the ship at the end of the working day, we have to go around the reef and all the way up to our ship. What happened when you are exploring or working in a place which is quite far away from your ship, from your expedition boat, is that you go and in the Zodiac you put like two dive bottles per person because you dive the first time, you finish your bottle, you come up, you rest a little bit, you change your bottle, you go down again because you don't want to go all the way back to the ship just to change bottles. So that makes those trips first very slow because the Zodiac is very heavy with the divers and double of the gear and the, the, the bottles, they are heavy as well. And when you finish your exploration, let's say at one or two in the afternoon, you really want to come back to the ship fast. You don't want to go around the entire reef. We were actually totally opposite to the position of our boat. So we could go through the east and go to the boat, or you can go to the west. It will be the same time. It was about one and a half hour with everyone really tired, people e hungry. Equally as far, equally as annoying, there was whatever side you choose. 
<laughs> there was no shorter way. Well, <laughs> until I came up with the idea, and that's why I'm including this episode in the mm. Risking Your Life series, I came mm. up with the idea like, okay, we are here, our ship is there, we are going around this thing because it has been low tide, but today it will come high tide, and this high tide will cover the reef so we can go straight to our ship. We will save probably half an hour of trip. And everyone said, yeah, sure, brilliant, let's do it. So. <laughs> Nobody's gonna argue with the most annoying part. Nobody's gonna think deeper. They're like, oh, okay, high tide, no reef, let's go. <laughs> yeah, because as I have mentioned... It would make sense. The tides in Mozambique are quite wide. Mm -hmm. the, you have sometimes four or five meters of difference. So, yes, you are exploring and working in a place that you see the reef there. The reef is dry. But when the water comes in, you sometimes have two or three meters of depth that with the zodiac is more than enough. Easy. Not a problem. Yeah. It's not dangerous at all. Yeah. And I said, okay, let's wait a little bit for the tide to come up and then we go straight and we don't go around this stupid reef. Well, <laughs> the combination of the tide going in quite slow and us trying to save time, but we were sitting in the Zodiac waiting for the tide to come up. It was a little bit like, <laughs> silly as well. I said, so it took exactly the same time or more. <laughs> and under the sun and not moving and people really desperate. So, and I said at a certain point, okay, there is water enough, let's go. So we, <laughs> we went straight to the reef that it has some water on it. We couldn't calculate from far how much water it had. We went there and then when we were arriving to the reef with the little breakers, because the sea conditions were quite good, the sea was quite flat and there was little breakers there. And then it came what we call a road wave. A rogue wave, you may have heard about it in documentaries and movies. A rogue wave is a wave that is unusually high for certain conditions and it doesn't really respond to the pattern of the waves. Pa the that, pattern of the set. That, yeah. that we know, you know, like the sets yeah. of waves, like every so many waves there will come three or mm -hmm, four. Six, seven. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. These are crazy waves. These are waves that come <laughs> out of nowhere. They are normally huge waves. And this was waiting for us when we tried to go in the little breakers, otherwise a very comfortable navigation in the Zodiac in the way to our ship. And then it came this monster wave from behind of us. I'm in the upper engine and I don't know why I look back and I saw that scene coming to us. I mean, this is a Zodiac you cannot speed it up much more than we did. I mean, you are full power with the outboard engine and you are just navigating at the speed that this Zodiac full of bottles and people could get. And on top of it, this super big wave, when it comes, it kind of sucks the water from under your boat because it's like... <laughs> so, so you're like scraping the, on the reef and yeah. nothing. <laughs> you are trying to speed up your boat, but the water is coming on the With other no direction. The, the wave is, <laughs> is building up behind you. It was a very... It was a terrifying experience because the wave... Scary! ...came from the back of our Zodiac. It puts the Zodiac in this position and then it pushed us I mean, you are trying this wave not start breaking yet, because if it starts breaking on the top, you're if the lip then, is on top of then, you, you're gone. Then you're yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah. But it was yeah. like pushing us like this all the way. <laughs> then we got some speed. I'm pushing the I'm pushing the engine to the maximum to try to gain some speed and get away from there. Obviously, that you can't. But the main thing is to keep the sodia in this position, not to go sideways because if it goes sideways it will flip and it will be the end. So trying to keep the zodiac straight, this thing pushing us, I don't know how many kilometers an hour, pushing us, pushing us, pushing us, and then it left us, it's like the wave recedes, we end up in the reef, well okay, with water, but we end up on top of the reef and 
all around us was foam. What happened with foam is that it doesn't matter how much you put the propeller of your engine is going, it's like going Has in, not the, enough to in grab. the air. It doesn't grab because there is yeah. little water, it's mostly foam. And then we're trying there, we try to get away from that dangerous place and the next wave is coming. Well, okay, the other wave was not as big as this one. We managed to slowly get out of that situation. I could see the faces of my colleagues in the boat, this kind of embarrassed smile <laughs> that everyone is like, yeah. They're like, yeah, that, we survived that, this. That, that, that was, was the close. smart thing to do. Well done, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for not killing us, Alex. Thank well, you so much. The end of the story. We arrive in our ship all nervous about the same time that we have to us to go around the reef in any direction, <laughs> but with a very with a very nice story to tell. With, uh, with an episode for a YouTube channel. <laughs> well, at that time there was not even YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but hey, here we are. But also, so all of us, we gain a little bit of experience from that situation in which we had other experience with rogue waves that they always happen to us, at least it has always happened when the sea conditions are very good, they are perfect. So you tend to relax because the conditions are great, there is no reason why you should be worried about the waves. I, the other rogue wave I will tell you the day that I made the episode of the Pinda Bank, which is an incredible place, and the other rogue wave got us there. This one was the first, and we learned from that, and we always kept an eye on this particular wave that comes out of every pattern of the other waves and sometimes it even comes from different directions which is worse because you are prepared to receive waves from here and you are not expecting to get away from there or a wave from your back. So I wanted to tell you this story first because it happened in a beautiful scenario. The Kirimbas Archipelago is a marvelous place. Second, because we have to go through, let's say, a little bit of an unorthodox way of getting our authorization to go there. So we were all very impressed and happy with that. And third, because this wreck that we estimate that is the Nossa Senhora do Populo from 1619, it was a wreck that I was always wondering where it could have ended up because the historical files put the wreck in a slightly different location. So yeah, we could still have found the Nossa Senhora do Populo from 1619 as it was not our research area. I didn't go back to the wreck. We just have it located for future studies. And in the last part, because it was something that really puts us in danger. I don't want to repeat myself about who's guilty for that and that human error <laughs> is always present in all these close calls, but well. It's not convenient in the story. It, but, but well, <laughs> you can make your own conclusion. I'm very happy if you liked the video, please leave it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it, share it with your friends and let's keep on diving.